All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome. It's been a long three days, um, and the room's pretty packed. Um, so just try and get space wherever you can. But before I start, I just want to give a big shout out to welcome the officer trainees from the Susan Saraj Institute of Foreign Service. We're thrilled that you're here today. You're the future of India. Um, and we wish in future GTSs, you could spend more time here and interact. And this, I'm sure there's a lot we could learn from you. So welcome. Um, I'm going to get straight into it because we've got about 25, 30 minutes. I'm with two maverick diplomats um, who've converted their lives into many different avatars. <laughs> and I'm, so let, let me perhaps start with uh, Ambassador Shingla. You've just stepped out of a chaotic, very busy last one year with huge outcomes. Almost every discussion in any gathering such as this or otherwise is discussing some aspect of the outcome of the G20. If I could ask you two questions. For you, what was the most difficult task in the last 12 months? And second, what surprised you the most? Well, thank you, Rudro. And first of all, um, let's, let me say how you know, delighted I am to be here and to have so many good friends uh, in our audience, in particular our officer trainees of the Foreign Service. It's, it's great to have them here. Um, yes, I mean, G20 was uh, like bringing order into, as you said, you know, a chaotic scenario because uh, when we took over the presidency, uh, the world was in some level of ferment, continues to have its complications. Uh, but we had our challenges outlined right from the beginning. And I think what was important for us was to uh, ensure that uh, we held a presidency that uh, was clearly post-COVID and in many senses, uh, one that could surmount uh, the geopolitical challenges of the day. I think that was very important. And our greatest, I think, uh, uh, task as president was to ensure that those challenges did not come in the way of the more important and pressing global issues of the day which I think every um, country, especially from the developing world uh, wanted, is basically to address issues such as rising inflation, indebtedness, uh, issues of supply and demand, uh, and uh, a range of uh, issues there that affected the daily lives of people across the world. Uh, and I think to that extent, uh, we, we succeeded. Uh, I would say the challenges were uh, not only geopolitical in nature, but also organizational. Uh, we did realize right in the beginning that uh, we really needed to take an event and convert it into a movement. And uh, you saw that the Prime Minister's vision, vision was to take the G20 to every part of India. Uh, for our country, it's always been, uh, you know, international events have always been remote uh, happenings in the capital city. And so uh, for the first time to take 220 G20 meetings into 60 cities of our country, I think was uh, a very, very... Uh, unique, but also a very daunting sort of task. And, and for me as chief coordinator, I think one of the challenges was how do we take the G20, uh, maintain the standards of the G20 in uh, many of our cities that had little international exposure and uh, they were, which also had uh, capacity constraints, honestly. And I think we worked on all of those systematically. Uh, I think we really, uh, there was a lot of effort on urban transformations, developing infrastructure in some of these cities, and most important, bringing confidence into cities across uh, our country in the Northeast, uh, Srinagar, Jammu and Kashmir, Dakshadweep, Diu, places that uh, were not really uh, on the map when it came to international events. So that was challenging, but I think my own sense is that the uh, the hospitality, the welcome, the warmth, and the cultural diversity and heritage that was on display enabled us to really collectively work on the delegates that came to India. And that in part contributed. I mean, I know I'm talking about something which is a uh, little different from what you'd normally hear, but that in part contributed to the final outcomes that actually emerged. Uh, that delegates that came into India for G20 meetings got such a reception. They were so enamored with their experience of India that they really wanted to work on creating a, a certain level of positivity. So by the time we reached the summit, you already had a groundswell level of support. And needless to say, we worked very closely with all of our partners, uh, uh, especially the US, in ensuring that we transcended 
our differences and made, uh, um, you know, brought about an outcome that uh, the world could uh, agree with and one that actually had the ability to, uh, to bring solutions to global challenges. No, thank you. And I'll perhaps come back to some of those points, but let me switch to Ambassador Gassetti. You've asked me to be provocative, um, maybe in a bit. Um, you're a twice elected mayor for major American city. You've been here for now about eight months. What do you find is the, the kind of biggest challenge that you have in your job? Well, first of all, thank you for hosting us. Thank you, Carnegie. I know this has been an extraordinary week. Thank you, Ruja, for your leadership. And Harsh, it's always great to be on a stage. When you say two Mavericks, it's really one Maverick and a new kid in the diplomatic space. And to the trainees that are here, I think even in the eight months, though I've been in government service for much of my adult life, uh, and the lessons are similar, I would say the challenges of diplomacy are, are a little bit different. And they're only as strong as the relationships you build between countries, between diplomats. At the end of the day, forget titles between people. They are there to sustain you in the most difficult times when there's stress tests between countries, between people, between issue on issues. And they're there in the best times when you kind of can breathe and dream together. And they're there at the most critical junctures when as we had such marvelous leadership from India during G20. And I think in many ways, India rightfully so deserves the credit for landing something. But every country could have spoiled what we landed. And it took the U.S. going to a group of countries that we are close to. And it took India going to countries they had close relations with. And acknowledging where you don't have strengths is part of strength itself. And I think the challenge is admitting that, learning to be humble, figuring when to follow and not just to lead from the front. And I think the challenge in, in India, specifically of the US-India relationship, is that it's so broad and increasingly deeper that the speed with which our leaders, our people, um, even our bureaucracies are demanding results, it makes the capacity of the job, and this is a great problem to have, that difficult. Case in point, when Prime Minister Modi came to um, the state dinner in Washington, you know, somebody who was a vet of these said, if you get three to five good deliverables, that's a strong state dinner. The week before, we were plowing through 123 different deliverables, 123. And in fact, after it, it wasn't like everybody said, thank God that dinner is over. Now we can go back to the rest of the world. It has not let up. Remind us of stuff where we're going slow. And they're like, come on, you promised us the response to our paper that was the response to your paper. And Americans are telling Indians, what's happening to that approval? We need the extra position so we can do the things that you want. It's unprecedented. And in fact, this week when John Finer was here in our meeting with External Affairs Minister Jai Shankar, he said, think of that dinner, because we certainly do, not as a high point of U.S.-India relations, but a new base. And I tend to agree with that. It doesn't mean we won't have challenging moments. We won't have stress tests. We're kind of, uh, if we make this romantic, I've said it's like our Facebook status for a long time between U.S. and India was, it's complicated. Now, when you log on, it's like they're dating. And then we're trying to figure out, well, maybe we've even moved in together. And we're like, well, your habits are a little different than mine. Like, why do you leave the towel on the floor? Why, you know, can you please shut the door when you, you know, go into the kitchen? Whatever it is, we're figuring that out. And we're also kind of figuring out where does this go? There's, I'd say, a positive romantic ambiguity kind of about where this ultimately will lead. But I think in, in our hearts, it's not challenging to your question because there is strong desire on both parts that isn't just a calculation. I think it's both personal, and I'd come back to that point. Your biggest challenge and your biggest opportunity is how strong the relationships you have are for the best of times and the toughest of times. So if I can come to you, Ambassador Shingla, is best of times and most complicated of times. You went as ambassador to the United States in 2019. It's a complicated year. You had a very big visit soon after you got there. You were ambassador for about, for about a year. You came back as our top civil servant in the Ministry of External Affairs. In that time, a lot of the discussions that we had between the US and India, if I remember correctly, a lot of that was about US-India trade, Harley Davidson, apples, uh, agriculture. Defense was always considered to be a bit of the silver lining in the relationship. So the idea was that you had a bit of buoyancy because of the strategic logic that had been built by many people sitting in this room, yourself and others, over the last 10 to 20 years, right? 
but we didn't really have a kind of a, a diplomatic spear, right? Today, you have a new framework. You've got this initiative on critical emerging technologies. We've just spent three days with a lot of discussions on what can we do in AI? What can we do in semiconductors? There's, you know, there's co-production happening on the defense side. Um, if I can ask, what do you attribute this change to? What's the key driver for you for this change? What's making it happen? Well, I mean, you know, the relationship is, is, is amazingly multifaceted, um, but it's also constantly evolving. And I think uh, Master Garcetti referred to that uh, fact uh, uh, in his earlier remarks. The fact is that you need to work on the relationship constantly. And, uh, and I think that has uh, been one of the attributes that we've constantly worked to find, uh, you know, the momentum or to, to keep the momentum going and to find new areas where uh, there is a convergence. Um, uh, technology was always there, but the uh, ICET has given it uh, that very vital, uh, you know, focus. Um, of course, when I was there, it was a different administration and... Uh, and in many senses, it was one of the most uh, challenging periods, but at the same time, one of the most rewarding periods uh, in our relationship. And we, um, we really, uh, I think, had to work very hard to keep that at, at an even keel. Um, one of the things I think we um, had to, um, I think, really focus on was uh, to make sure that, uh, um, you know, the relationship remained... Uh, one that was immune from the bipartisan polarization that was very evident uh, in, in Congress, uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, polity at that time. And I think we succeeded. Uh, I mean, one of the high points of the relationship really was uh, the Howdy Modi event in Houston. And I'm very happy to see Anupam Ray, who's our ambassador to, uh, to dis the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva with us, because he was part of our team that made that happen. Uh, Howdy Modi was... Uh, not so much an organizational challenge. Of course, you had 50,000, uh, you know, Indian Americans uh, at the stadium. You had the U.S. president and the Indian prime minister who addressed that gathering. I think it was in many senses historic, uh, one that uh, you uh, really rarely see uh, that level of bonhomie and that level of, uh, I would say, support uh, for a relationship expressed by American and American citizens of Indian origin. Uh, but uh, I think what was really challenging was to ensure that uh, in that event, we had a bipartisan lineup. And it had nothing to do with us. It was more the polarizations of that polity. And uh, I'm very happy to say that uh, that working uh, in the United States also meant that you, uh, you understood the federal nature of that country as you understand the federal nature of our own country. So only, I think... Uh, an Indian, to some extent, can understand what the United States is all about because there are, you know, 50 states in the U.S. and we are also a country that uh, has a very strong federal character. You needed to go out and meet people in their respective areas. And I'm very happy that one of the people I went and called on was Master Garcetti in uh, his wonderful uh, town hall in, in Los Angeles. And, uh, and I think we've been uh, great friends since. And it's, it's wonderful to have you here, Ambassador. But the fact of the matter is that we had to work on ensuring that the Prime Minister's event was one which is bipartisan. And I think we succeeded because we had uh, a very good lineup of both uh, Democrats and Republicans. And I think that stood us in good stead. The fact that we've transitioned, uh, you know, from President Obama uh, to President Trump uh, to President Biden, uh, the Prime Minister had, has had excellent relationships with each of these uh, presidents. But some of that was lost in the clutter because, you know, many of uh, uh, the political, uh, let's say, uh, representatives felt that, uh, that uh, you know, you were excessively close to what they, they saw as a Republican administration. Uh, but we are as close to, uh, to a Democratic administration. And today, if there's anything that uh, establishes the point, I think we have succeeded in keeping that relationship at an even keel, irrespective of uh, governments uh, and administrations uh, uh, in, 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 in office. Uh, that, that's the important challenge. And I think that we need to continue to maintain that level of political stability. And that is what enables us to achieve everything else on the ground, whether it's technology, whether it's the people to people connect, it's trade, investments. I think that relationship between uh, the President of the United States, the Prime Minister of India, an executive presidency, a very, very you know, powerful prime ministership in India, 
that momentum has to be maintained and you cannot allow that to be derailed so this is the point i was trying to make so if i can just pick up one question basi gasetti so there's of course the political equations you're a fan of golbrith i'm a fan of golbrith that's why we call this ambassador's journal um he served as a ambassador in a very tricky time in india perhaps one of our worst times 1962 um had to do many different things out of the box in order to basically stitch up a solution in many different ways taking the questions so of one is you've got political equations which are obviously critical in geopolitics but then you've got hard geopolitics we're at a stage at the moment where it seems to us that some of the logic in the india us relationship is driven by china is some of it is driven by the need to perhaps reglobalize the external affairs minister in broad terms on monday talked about reglobalizing to that to me that means basically shifting units of economic production out of areas which are over concentrated if i could ask is if you felt that india was in a place that could not absorb that de-risking would that be a problem for the united states it's a great question i think it would be a missed opportunity but i think my honest answer to my indian friends is no but that's not a reason why in any way we would withdraw from the work that we are doing or not push it as strongly as we can because i do think it's critical to the world so what do i mean by that if we're going to be just frank with each other the us economy about 2% of our economy depends on interaction with india just 2% we're seeing fdi not yet flowing in in the rates i know india wants or that we would want here from china it's going to vietnam it's going to mexico and i think there's still some really good conversations my indian friends are having about what does it take not to make one off exceptions for companies but to fundamentally restructure how we tax inputs so we can have more outputs when it comes to manufacturing because this is still the highest taxed input major economy in the world and i get why it's not a criticism there's not enough taxpayers base so how do you raise revenues when you have a shortfall it's usually it's easier politically to do on outsiders but it's harming your own internal capacity to really be the manufacturing powerhouse that i believe india should be that we want it to be and that it is starting to accelerate to become but it will require i think some fundamentally deeper changes when i think about the us india relationship i think and to the china point a lot of people overstate that china is the reason we are together I don't believe that at all. I think it's one of the most important pressing things we talk to and that we are aligned on. But too often I was frustrated in Washington talking to people who were saying who would only say, "Oh, US India, China," or "US India, human rights." And nothing in between. Legitimate things to talk in both. Sometimes we're aligned, sometimes where we may have divergences or interpretations of divergence. But our relationship is 95% about fundamentally other things. China is about deterrence it's about i can talk about the four p's which is kind of our our mission on a mission here peace prosperity planet and people i think it summarizes the entire agenda that we're pursuing here and that in many ways us and india are pursuing so peace is critical but deterring war respecting borders and sovereignty making sure that we don't have people who steal intellectual property that we're not overly dependent on any one place for a supply chain that is a deterrent piece and most of what we can do should not be because any third party brings us together i believe the us india relationship is not additive i believe it's multiplicative we demonstrated that at g20 when it was more than just 1 plus 1 equals 2 countries i think 1 plus 1 actually produced 20 countries together with a historic and strongest deepest statement ever put forward by a g20 This is I wrote this something down a second ago. It is not an alliance, but it is an ambition. And we are not seeking to create a pull between the two of us, but a potential of what I see India loves what I call geometric diplomacy. Triangles, quadrilaterals. Cuz the multilateral space hasn't been so friendly always to India even though it's led that sometimes. But when it got too big, India gets lost and the bilateral comes with too many conditions. The US and India I think are a force for good in the world together not just for our countries. Recently we had doctors come from Fiji, the largest training ever for something called the Trilateral Development Program that we have together with Ministry of External Affairs and our USAID, training doctors and nurses in medicine in the most remote parts of Fiji, 
trained by Indians, partially funded by Americans here in Delhi. Imagine us taking that to another dozen countries. Imagine taking India's work on DPI with our technological prowess of putting things in the cloud and going to Pacific Island countries, African countries, uh, maybe Southeast Asian countries and saying, you can have digital ID, health, you can do digital payments based on what India has led on and this partnership together. Look at the quad, look at I2U2, which will come back and be important and strong, I believe. These are the places where I think this relationship is about so much more than some other country or a threat. It fundamentally is about us, how we look at ourselves and the potential and the hard truths you can say to each other. India tells us hard truths sometimes. Like, you think our taxes are high here? Why are you writing the IRA and not letting us into critical minerals when you say you want us to be part of critical mineral supply chains in the future? And in our opinion, the IRA is too nationalistic towards us. So can we find preferred geography? preferred relationship. Maybe it's not an alliance, maybe it's not a poll, but it certainly is deeper than what we had yesterday and even today. So if I could keep to the vibe of that answer, Ambassador Gassetti, and Ambassador Shingla, if I could ask you, you know, the other day, uh, we've done a lot on US and India, whether it's here at GTS, the last year because of ISET, there's just been a lot of US India activity, space, AI, defense, and a range of areas. But there was a brilliant minister from Sierra Leone, and she came up to me yesterday and said, look, this is, this is great. And I'm really happy that the US and India have found a new compact in the last decade or two decades. Um, but what does that mean for me? And, and so I asked her, I said, what is, what do you mean? And I don't know if she's here, but, um, and she, so I asked her, so, and her thing was, look, the US doesn't get us. It's difficult sometimes for the US to get countries like us, right? But it's a big country. There's a lot of capacity. Um, India kind of gets us. But perhaps there's not as much capacity as we'd like. So, Ambassador Shingla, I was just wondering, thinking five years or 10 years, if I pick up Ambassador Gassetti's point, do you think at some point we seriously need to think about what can US, India or others actually do as a force for good? I mean, the examples are great of Fiji, of health, and I really hope DPI kind of, you know, we can do a lot more with DPI. But are we giving enough serious thought? I mean, in terms of what the two countries can actually do in large parts of the world where there is a need and a demand? and an appetite. Well, um, I, one thing I could share was that, uh, you know, um, when I was in uh, Washington, I was struck by the fact that uh, much of our conversations really uh, went beyond the bilateral. I mean, I come from a strongly bilateral uh, background and going to DC was quite an experience because whether you spoke to state or you spoke to the White House, or you spoke to congressmen or you spoke to think tanks, uh, you know, the dialogue always transcended the bilateral into regional and uh, global uh, issues and cooperation. And, and I think uh, that was the basis of a very strong partnership. Uh, Master Garcetti spoke about the fact that, you know, we are collaborating on issues that, uh, that uh, you know, allow us to synergize our strengths, our respective strengths. I think there is a huge scope for us to look at a joint development partnership that would take uh, the issue of uh, uh, you know human centric a global human centric partnership uh, forward and some of that uh, was reflected in the G20 uh, uh, summit now uh, if you look at uh, the fact that uh, you know there is uh, there, there are issues like global security where we see um, very much eye to eye on issues such as counter terrorism you have uh, climate change which is important for both our countries we have a very regular dialogue on climate change, but also how do you take it, uh, you know, to the rest of the world? And of course, uh, global connectivity. For example, the Quad talks about global connectivity. The India, Middle East, Europe economic corridor is about uh, connectivity. And, uh, and I think there is a lot of convergence in that area. So how can we take our experience? Of course, it is, uh, we have our respective areas of experience and their differentiated experience. But they're nonetheless areas that we can work together on, synergize, as you mentioned, capacity as, as uh, uh, also uh, merging with, uh, you know, the understanding of the global south and take that uh, into Africa, for example, where, uh, you know, we can make a difference uh, to the lives of people, uh, whether it's on DPI uh, or whether it is uh, on issues such as simple issues such as uh, modern technology in bringing modern technology into farming, uh, you know, increasing productivity of, uh, of crops in parts of uh, uh, semi-arid or arid areas of uh, Africa. 
so uh, there is a huge uh, opportunity there that we can really work on and i think we are already doing that in many senses we are doing that bilaterally we are doing that in plurilateral uh, fora such as uh, the um, you know the quad and uh, and other areas and then of course the indo pacific i think one of the most brilliant schemes that was conceived when we had uh, the first uh, in person uh, quad leader summit and and masagasati and i spoke about it just before we entered the hall uh, in in dc this was september 2021 in the heights of covid was how can we take a us uh, you know a us vaccine or vaccine produced with us technology manufactured in india uh the japanese providing uh you know the the transportation and the australians providing the last mile support into the indo pacific and i think uh, you know one example of that was uh, providing vaccines uh, to countries like cambodia and thailand uh, in the indo pacific of course that came in when uh, i would say we were already on the uh, you know i said downward curve of covid but the fact is that the idea that uh, the four quad partners could use their respective strengths and take it to the indo pacific on an issue that the rest of the world really was looking for support on was something that was quite extraordinary uh, so what can we do uh, together i mean using the us's strengths uh, and resources and capacities using our own i would say uh, efforts to uh, to uh, an experience on human centric development uh, understanding uh, the global south and also being able to take uh you know make sure that our uh buck goes a longer way uh making sure that uh, that we have uh, the economies of scale that we are uh uh quite used to in our own uh, development assistance programs how can we synergize those and take it not just with the united states but with like minded partners and make that vital difference look at connectivity for example you know we uh we uh, connectivity has been a major issue globally uh there has been uh, different efforts at promoting connectivity but we need a paradigm that provides connectivity that is transparent uh that does not uh, indebt nations uh, that respects the territorial integrity and sovereignty of states that has those elements that countries look to uh and i think that's that's a win-win situation so there's a there's a range of areas there and i think we can do very well together Okay I just want to take the I've got a little bit of time left I want to take the structure and the US India part out of it and just end with a question on each of you India is a very different ocean to LA um how is it going for you what do you enjoy the most about this job you know the things that are similar between LA and India is you know LA and India are both sandwiches that the more bites you take the bigger it gets it's like a paradox you're never going to know the complexity in fact the more you know the more you know you don't know so you have to be willing to not conquer knowledge of a place like india la obviously much smaller in population but similar level of diversity it's almost unknowable and yet you have to narrate within it i i love when i can pop my bubble you know when you're an ambassador i uh, think harsh can confirm this you you move in a bubble so to talk to real people you have to like pop that bubble and i've tried to use culture and food and cricket and you know going to the northeast recently and you know been in 18 17 states in 8 months um and union territories so i love that part of india i've always loved it since i came here when i was 14 years old for the first time um i also love that it's a weakness of america but i love how indians and india know america and american so much better than vice versa So my job isn't just to bring America here but to bring India back to America. There's a great awakening happening in America. It's happening in business, it's happening in government. Um where everybody's like I got to understand India. And so to me that professionally is so exciting because you know our, our Secretary of Treasury this was the number one country she went to outside the United States four times this year. Secretary of State just came here for the third time. Secretary of Defense for the second time. FBI director is here next week, you know. You you name it every week. It's an exhausting job, but we have so many people coming through. And we have a president who I know is the very first president ever to say that this is the most consequential relationship in the world. No US president has ever said that. And you you're right, Harsh, that this has gone through democratic and republican presidents and the mood always goes forward some of the work goes forward but sometimes the work actually does move backwards there's conflicts on energy there's conflicts on trade well joe biden's been president this is not a political speech i don't do politics while i'm a, a ambassador everything's going up 
in terms of the collaboration, the actual work. And it is, it's still wider than it is deep, but it's deeper than it's ever been. And it is a new base. I do agree with Minister Jai Shanker. It's a new base, not a high point. In fact, if you look at the mountain of this relationship, where if you look down, you realize how far we've come. You can always look up and see a peak ahead, but it's just, my wife says, stop saying this because it sounds like it's not a hard job to do, but it is the most fun job I've ever had because India is fun. If you don't just get Washington and Delhi as this relationship, but you see the rest of America interacting with the rest of, of India. And the last thing I'll say is remember, it's easy to caricature both of our countries. It's easy to think of America as this powerful, like Senegal saying, like they don't get us. The thing that's a little different about America than other wealthy and powerful countries is we actually are you. You know that as Indians, right? 1.4% uh, of our population now is, you know, descended from or immigrants uh, that are Indian. 6% of our tax base, by the way, 10% of our Fortune 500 company now CEOs, et cetera. But whether it's a refugee from Myanmar, whether it is folks coming from Mexico, we actually have connections to both the developed and developing world that are unique. So I think this human-centered development idea, I love that you said that, really needs to be that guiding principle for a moral U.S. foreign policy. And the power of how we can translate, you know, to each other, we're like the good housekeeping seal of approval for the developing and developed world. If we can say, hey, I can vouch for India, and India can say, I can vouch for the United States, this sorry, this multiplicative relationship becomes something that is exponential in its capacity. And that's a lot of fun. You know, thank you. That's, that's a wonderful answer. Ambassador Shingla, if I could end with you, he did 18 states in eight months. You did 21 states in nine months when you were in the United States. Um, there's a brilliant biography of Ambassador Shingla called Not an Accidental Rise. So if I could ask you, if that was Not an Accidental Rise 1.0, what does Not an Accidental Rise, the life of Har Shingla 2.0 look like? Well, uh, let me say that I'm really in danger of uh, being surpassed. Master Gasetti is about to overtake my record of, of states. And I think it's a great thing because, you know, as I said, we live in vibrant democracies, but we are also federal, federal nations. And uh, the best way to see India is to go out and see it uh, in, in, in uh, you know, its forms across the country, the diversity uh, and the absolute, uh, you know, variation that you come across. And I think it's the same for the United States in many senses. Unless you go out, you meet people and you're actually meeting people where they live and where they actually uh, belong to, I think it makes that difference. I, I found that meeting a senator in Alaska was so much more productive than meeting him in, in the Capitol Hill. Um, you know, he's, he's happy to show you around. He's happy to give you his time. And that's what makes that vital difference. And I'm, I'm, Glad that, uh, you know, uh, Eric, you've hit the ground running and you've gone and, uh, you know, seen India the way it should be. And, and I think that's the way that our relationship has to move forward. And uh, that's, that's the way to do it. Uh, about uh, 2.0, uh, Rudro, I'm not uh, that sure. I mean, what is important is that, uh, you know, you have the opportunity at every stage. And there, there comes a stage in your life where you have to really do a bit of a makeover. And, and that makeover is always challenging. It's, it's always easier to say that I can now, you know, take it easy and we don't have to do, make that effort. But I think at every stage in life, you know, you start at a certain point, you want a certain career, you started a career, you want to take it to a certain direction, uh, you end a certain career and you want to take it to some other way. Um, for us in the foreign service, and we've discussed it many times, uh, you know, it's, it's a really, uh, you know, cradle to grave sort of model where you're in that bubble, uh, Eric mentioned the bubble, you're in the bubble and, uh, and, and you're quite comfortable in that bubble, you know, you don't want to get out of the bubble. And I think the challenge is to get beyond that bubble, uh, you know, make uh, something out of, uh, out of uh, a reality that is beyond that bubble. And I think that's, that's what stimulates you. That's challenging, it's difficult, uh, but I think it's really worth that effort. And that's, that's my suggestion to many of our own uh, colleagues, uh, you know, you must have the intrinsic ability to go out and make that difference. And it doesn't have to be only in the area that you're working on. It can be in many other areas. Ambassador Shingla, Ambassador Garcetti, bubble breakers. Thank you very much for spending this evening with us.